Hi, I'm Toby. And I'm Nick. And welcome to the Pure Property Podcast from Track Capital, where we give you our industry insight, knowledge and expertise in bite-sized chunks to help investors invest intelligently. So first month of the year is uh, out of the way. So we go into this month now, February. Uh, January is pretty much the same as it was from last year. So market's still good. Uh, we've had sort of more progression as well in the general uh, circumstances we find ourselves in, which, as you all know, is COVID, hence us uh, recording this remotely still. So that's good. Vaccine still being rolled out um, and yeah, pretty much still still moving forward as we were last month. So on to our topic of conversation this week. Nick, do you want to introduce it? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. So this week, we're going to be running through property purchasing costs and property running costs as well. So basically, what we'll discuss is the key considerations around the financials and, and what you have to pay out for leading up to and during the purchase process. And then once your property is up and running, uh, what costs to think about at that stage as well. So, yep, uh, ready to to go ahead with this today and, and really spell out uh, everything that people have to think about, because um, obviously it's a big consideration and we want to make sure we're really specific when we're looking at any costs for any type of property purchase. So hopefully today is going to be helpful. And uh, we're going to obviously try and focus this around the the off plan slash uh, new build properties, just as this is our main focus point. But uh, you'll find probably 99 percent of these are all relevant to even the secondary market. They just may vary slightly. Uh, and that's just one other caveat that I probably want to go over is that these are just sort of average and, and rough guides. They won't be exact because they do vary quite a lot what we've tried to do is give you a good sort of base or average uh, price and level that they tend to come in at based on our experience and, and what we've um, come across in the past so Nick why don't you uh, get the ball rolling and, and yeah yep so uh, exactly as you mentioned so these are sort of general indications or indicative rates uh, if anyone does want specifics then obviously get in touch with the team and we can go through that so the first one we're going to be looking at is a sourcing or administration fee so what some people may not be aware is that there's a, a more the um, sort of people working on an individual basis or self-employed property sources. So what they'll do is they'll find potentially below market value properties or off market properties. You won't be able to find a right move and things like that. Um, and then they will charge an investor a fee for introducing them to that property. And typically that would be from an end user. So an, an owner occupier that's potentially looking for a quick exit. Now, um, the other side of it is companies similar to ours. So um, investment agencies, they may charge a administration fee for handling the transaction or they may charge a, a sourcing fee as well. Um, but in both cases, this can range from anything from as low as £1,000 up to £5,000. We do actively know competitors charging a £5,000 fee to introduce investors to developments at the moment. Um, so yeah, that, that's what you can look at on the sourcing side. And as I say, it's not always the case that you, you need to uh, use a sourcer, um, but if they can find a genuine below market value property or something that you can't buy online or register interest through Rightmove, Zoopla, etc., then it can certainly be worthwhile. But yeah, the first fee would be the sourcing slash administration fee. And next up, I'm going to cover legal fees. So when you're purchasing a property, as you will probably know, you have to instruct solicitors to carry out the legal process for you. So they will handle the conveyancing process. Now, this will depend um, on the, the solicitors you choose. Prices do vary. Uh, you can get um, different levels of solicitors. And obviously, if you're buying a limited company, you will have to use a commercial um, solicitor. And if you're buying your personal name, you could just use a normal residential solicitor. This can vary from sort of a thousand pounds plus fat uh, upwards. 
but they can also be slightly cheaper. Uh, but then you also have to factor in disbursements, which will be added on top. This can be anything such as your search pack, ID check. Most solicitors have a, a standard they will charge for, but you'll, you'll, you'll find some solicitors may have uh, different disbursements they do charge for that aren't included in their actual fee. The main fee that you'll be looking at, uh, which is across the board, sort of a good comparison, is the, 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 the amount that you're paying the solicitor for their time. And that's that's where we have the sort of a thousand pounds um, sort of average. So that's what you'll be paying the solicitor for their time to handle the transaction for you. Um, but as we mentioned, there will be disbursements involved. And whenever you get a quote from a solicitor, they will be able to give you an exact breakdown of the disbursements that will definitely uh, be needed and also potential ones that uh, come along the way. But we say to factor in anywhere from £1,000 to 2000 for your legal fees. Perfect. So that's the, uh, the legal side of things covered. Now, next up, we're saying mortgage broker fees is a, another cost that you want to consider. So when people are reviewing investments, they might speak to their bank uh, who they're with currently um, and try and arrange a mortgage. Uh, but we do encourage investors to go a bit wider in their search. So if you can get yourself a decent mortgage broker who's got access to the entire market, it should give you a much wider range of products to look at different time frames, different rates from all different lenders. Now, if you do proceed to either get an agreement in principle or you do move forward with a mortgage arrangement via a broker, they will typically charge a fee for that service. Um, and that can be anything from 600 to 900 pounds is what we see on average. Uh, but obviously, yes, it's an upfront cost. But if you look at the potential savings there and the wider variety of mortgage products you have available to you, it can be well, well worth it, particularly if you're buying in a limited company name or perhaps you've got adverse credit history or perhaps you're going for a slightly more non-traditional uh, property investment, um, maybe on the commercial side, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yes, mortgage broker fees, definitely something you want to uh, sort of um, consider in your in your initial costings. And typically they can fall in at about 600 to 900 pounds, depending on the, on the firm. Uh, plenty of options out there, both online and more traditional as well. So yeah, mortgage broker fees is one. Yeah, and following on from the mortgage broker fees, uh, another one is mortgage survey fee. Now, um, most mortgage products will tend to have the mortgage survey free of charge, uh, and that will just be the standard valuation. Um, that's the most common one, especially with the new build and off planners. You don't really need a, a structural um, um, survey done on that because it's going to be new and, and all signed off and, and hopefully all good. Um, so mortgage survey. And again, this can vary depending on the lender, but this can be anywhere from a couple of hundred pounds to, to four or five hundred pounds, depending. Uh, but it's something to bear in mind because not all lenders will include the valuation survey and do do check but the broker would always let you know about this if there is an additional cost for the mortgage valuation okay good stuff now moving on to the big one stamp duty aka stamp duty land tax so as many of you will know this is a, a tax that's placed on the purchase completion when you buy a property in the uk uh, we're not going to go into the specific rates in detail today um, but we can give you an idea of what those would be for, for any one property. Um, and we'd also link a stamp duty calculator in the episode notes. Um, but yes, at the moment, big, big debates going on about whether the stamp duty holiday in the UK should be extended. And also we've got an overseas surcharge coming in in April for um, for obviously non-residents buying into the UK property market. So it's more important than ever to have a really strong understanding of what your stamp duty land tax liability would be. Um, yes, the broker can advise this on purchase, but also this will be obviously confirmed by any conveyance or solicitor during the purchase process as well. Uh, but yes, stamp duty land tax is a, is a big hit that we need to think about. Yes. And just quickly on that point, uh, a lot of investors, they don't always necessarily know that even with the stamp duty holiday that's currently available, 
you are still liable as an investor to still pay the 3% surcharge. The holiday is only beneficial if you are purchasing a property over the 125,000 level uh, because you, the holiday then comes into the equation of what you would pay as a normal residential buyer, uh, which yeah starts to be factored in over that amount. So just saying to remember is I do get a lot of investors say, oh, I don't have to pay stamp duty with the stamp duty holiday at the moment. Uh, and when you tell them, no, you still have to pay the 3% surcharge, it's not something they've necessarily factored in. So just bear that in mind. But on to the next cost, we have furniture pack costs. Now, not something that you will definitely have to take um, because you might not be furnishing the apartment. And again, um, depending on the, the type of property you're buying, sometimes a uh, furniture pack or furnishing the property isn't necessarily uh, a necessity. And that's something we can look into closer to the time when speaking with local letting agents to see what their thoughts are um, but you'll tend to find if you are looking at a furniture pack they tend to be around anywhere from two and a half thousand pounds to five thousand pounds and again this will depend on the size of the property that you're furnishing is it a one bed is it a two bed is it a studio is it a three bed uh, and also what's included in that furniture pack as well uh, you can Usually with uh, the majority of the developments that we deal with, the developers will actually have a pack that's readily available for you to purchase, which is obviously designed to fit the apartments. So again, can be a lot easier and more straightforward just to purchase their pack as you know it's going to fit the particular unit or apartment or property you're buying, uh, which obviously saves a lot uh, a lot of headache. It might be a slight premium for that, but eight times out of 10, I think when I've looked at investors at um, going to the wider market and sourcing them ourselves, by the time you've actually had to try and source one, uh, you've got a decent price, then you have to arrange for it to be delivered and fitted, etc., it tends to be a lot easier just to go with the developer's furniture pack. But again, a cost to bear in mind if you are looking to furnish the property. Okay, perfect. So those are the costs that you want to think about um, prior to, to getting the property let. So I think it's just worth very quickly recapping on those. So you've got potential sourcing and administration fees, legal fees, mortgage broker and mortgage surveys fees, uh, stamp duty land tax, and then furnishing the property. You want to think about the uh, the potential furniture pack that you could put in. So uh, once we're up and running, then uh, the first cost to, to think about would be the management fee. Now, there are different levels of management services available that most agencies will offer. So that could be on a let only basis. In other words, the agent will advertise the property for let or for rent and then introduce the tenant and then you take it from there. You collect the rent and deal with the maintenance, etc. And you can then have like a sort of a partial management service where, again, you pay a bit more, but they might be more involved in the maintenance side, collecting, chasing arrears, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then full management where they'll do everything from start to finish, you know, deposits, key collection, reference checks, management, arrears chasing, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it's it's really, really worth if you can um, really giving consideration to who's going to be managing the property. It can make things a lot, lot easier, particularly if you're an investor that wants a fully managed hands-off sort of strategy overall you get yourself a really reliable uh, efficient management company uh, you might have to pay a bit more compared to others but in the long term it's going to save you a lot of stress and potentially a lot of money as well especially if they've got you know really um, honest contractors on their books that they can recommend and um, yes definitely definitely worthwhile uh, most developments that you see advertised out there especially in the new build markets will have recommended management companies so you can just indicate your interest in using those guys um, and then obviously on the second market secondary market you can uh, ring around a couple of local agents nearby be really familiar with the area um, and understand the sort of uh, the, the contractors nearby etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but yes management companies is uh, one you want to think about as well typically just to summarize that one uh, the fees will come in anything from as low as 5% for a let-only service, right up to a, a fully blown um, 15% uh, short let management service. So typically what you, you could sort of factor in on a fully managed agreement is around 10 to 12%, including VAT of the monthly rent for your management service. Hopefully that all makes sense. 
yeah, that's a, um, obviously a big, big cost to factor in and, and something you definitely have to consider. Me personally, I have a property that's located uh, on my doorstep near where I live and I've also got um, some up north as well. All are fully managed uh, and I pay a premium and a good hefty fee for that. However, what I will say is I hardly have to deal with them. They don't take up any of my time. It's all taken care of. I only hear from the letting agent when it's really necessary, uh, which actually isn't that often. And one thing a lot of people don't factor in, um, they think, oh, letting agents don't really do much. But the one thing I think where they're definitely worth their weight in gold is it's the the legalities that they're able to take care of. I don't think a lot of people realise that when you are rent, renting out a property, the legislation, the legals, there's so many different sort of parts um, of the process um, during the tenancy period as well, that if you don't get done correctly and you're not following the law, um, it can be very costly for you. And these mistakes cost a lot. And what you're paying the letting agent for is obviously their expertise and knowledge to be up to date with all the standard and modern legislation, which if you try to keep up to date with that and in the know-how of it all, I assure you it's very, very difficult. So that's one thing I did want to sort of point out um, that, yeah, I think when you look at their fees, they're not just collecting rent and um, calling you if there's just a problem. As I said, the legal process, um, anything from just the contract for when you have a tenant um, go into your property, if there's a problem with that. Again, if you ever need to get a tenant out, that can be a massive costly mistake. So I just wanted to add that in because I think they don't always get the the gratitude or um, the praise that they deserve because it's a very tough job. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Uh, I suppose another way to word it would be they, they effectively take the risk away from you. So when you're looking at landlord obligations, things like gas certificates, EPCs, electrical testing, et cetera, et cetera. By having a management company in place, you know you simply don't have to worry about these, don't have to worry about when they're going to be renewed, don't have to worry about new legislation that's come in because the management company will inform you. Um, and obviously, if you're doing something a bit more advanced, like a HMO, uh, again, more stringent regulations there about fire uh, systems, et cetera, et cetera, fire doors. Um, so yeah, the management company will effectively take away that risk from you, uh, as well as taking away the, the time and effort that would be required from yourself. Yes, exactly. And I think one thing that you will notice is when you see in the news um, about a landlord being fined thousands of pounds because their property wasn't up to scratch and the living standards were bad or they've they've not um, they've not had their HMO up to regs, etc. Um, what you'll tend to find is these properties are actually managed by landlords that are just managing it themselves and don't have a letting agent because I assure you, if they did have a letting agent, the letting agent would be telling them it's not it's not up to scratch and they wouldn't be representing the landlord if that was the case. So, mm. yeah, when you see these scary stories, nine times out of ten, it will be a landlord managing it themselves. On to the next one. So you've covered the management uh, letting fee. Uh, the next one that we're going to speak about is service charges. So when you're buying an apartment, you have to bear in mind that one of the ongoing costs will be a service charge. So this will include the looking after of communal areas, etc., because there will be a management company in place. So this will be someone who will be looking after the, the building and the communal areas, and they charge a fee for that. You will get statements to see what they're spending the money from. So you, you do see where your money is going. Um, and sometimes you can be involved in that. Some residents or property owners can actually take over the management company. So that's also a possibility as well. Uh, but this will be a fee. Uh, and again, this does vary from development to development. It can be anywhere from £700, £800 up to £1,500, £2,000. It does depend. Um, but it can fluctuate. And what they tend to have as well is a portion of the money that you're paying in on a yearly basis will go into a pot, like a sinking fund. And they're able to then uh, sort of designate that um, to an unforeseen cost that may arise. Um, but yeah, it's one of the ongoing costs, which is one of your slightly larger ones. And when buying an apartment that you do have to factor in because this will, of course, affect your returns. 
Yeah, absolutely. So just touching on that quickly, I used to be a block manager effectively. So that's what we, uh, when we say service charges, we're exactly as Toby said, so covering all the communal areas of the building. So in terms of a cost for investors, uh, typically you'll see it charged at a pound per square foot rate. So you might see one pound 88 per square foot up to over four pound in London. So that's what they're referring to covering sort of cleaning, CCTV, water supply, refuse disposal, uh, insurance, uh, landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the point I wanted to make was, yes, you can get forecasts and projections from the developer and the, the management agent when you're considering purchasing a property. Uh, but what happens is uh, it ultimately it takes a year or two for this service charge to really um, get a lot more focused and where you work out a consistent charge. So basically what they're doing at the start is estimating what the potential costs are going to be. Then over time, over a year or two, um, the, the costs really become apparent what they are exactly. And then they're able to nail that down and really, really focus on what the ongoing costs are going to be. So yeah, I just thought that was worth um, considering as well, that you will get quotations on what the service charge will be, uh, but it, it may fluctuate ever so, ever so slightly. So yeah, that's service charges. Another one which a lot of investors, to be fair, they do know to look out for now um, because of all the uh, media stories around leasehold and, and ground rent. So, yeah, the next one is ground rent. Um, so this is a figure that's paid to the freeholder. Um, so that ultimately the, the owner of the land and the communal areas of the building. Now, you'll see this figure uh, typically or in an ideal world, it should be 0.1% of the property value per annum in terms of the cost to the investor um, or you might see a cash figure so 150 up to 350 pounds for example now um, yes it's all well and good knowing and understanding what those figures are in advance and ideally we want to see that at 0.1% because it's ideal for lending criteria so mortgage providers will consider this fee uh, but also we want to ensure that the the increase or the contractual uh, terms of the increase are not excessive or, or not too onerous so what we really want to see is a 10-year review of the ground rent uh, in line with the, the retail price index, i.e. inflation. So that way we know it's not going to double in year three, et cetera. So we can really, really forecast and, and know what our net returns are going to be. So yes, ground rent is definitely another one we want to factor in for a couple of reasons. Yeah, definitely. And I think you'll find as well, there's a lot of scare stories about ground rent um, because, yeah, people have had bad experiences when they come to buy and sell a property because of the ground rent uh, being um, a ridiculous amount and doubling every sort of five or 10 years, for example, um, which means lenders won't look at it. But the good thing is now uh, solicitors are very hot on this. So rest assured, uh, your solicitor will be able to cover you and protect uh, protect you on this. And they'll make sure that the ground rent agreement isn't, isn't something that's going to be detrimental, uh, not only to your purchase and sort of the young going cost you're gonna to have to pay but also the sale as well so the good thing about new developments is they are factoring in and, and putting in these these acceptable ground rents which is good um, but moving on to that we've got maintenance so maintenance is going to be sort of your ongoing um, cost to maintain your particular property. Um, of course, you've got uh, you've got the build warranty with a new build, so um, you you have a ten years um, guarantee on on that as well. And you'll also have a snag period initially. So uh, the developer will give you a time frame initially. It can be one to two years potentially. Where if there's any snags, any issues, they will come and sort that free of charge, which again is a great benefit to buying a new property because you know your maintenance costs um, in the initial period are going to be very very low so you also want to factor in that you may have some extra maintenance uh, that you will have to sort of potentially pay out mainly if you're buying on the secondary market because you're technically buying a used property so of course there's going to potentially be um, some uh, bits and pieces that may need to be improved or maintained or or replaced along the way that can be anything from i don't know uh, carpet y your carpet after a few years uh, may need replacing so that's that's sort of the maintenance that you'd have to bear in mind and as we said with the majority of properties that we deal with these are going to be very low because they are new properties yeah that's perfect so moving on to the next one insurance so not all landlords will will, will go for insurance um and there's obviously there's different insurance products out there. 
um, in terms of uh, landlord insurance, uh, contents insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So some of those might be the, the tenant's concern. But yes, you do want to have a think if there's any insurance products out there for you as well. Now, um, just as a side note on that, um, you could potentially look at um, insurance or uh, assurance to protect your rental income from the tenant. And again, there's companies out there that will that'll offer such uh, such services as well. So yes, insurance is another one that you would want to cost in. Yes. And then we move on to, which isn't something you you definitely have to put in, but it's something that we, we do recommend investors to consider, and that's a, a contingency pot. So we say rule of thumb, it's always a good idea to put aside 10% um, of your rental income as a contingency pot just to pay for any unexpected um, costs that may arise. And that sort of falls into sort of the maintenance side of things. Um, you, your dishwasher might break down uh, and it's not covered on any sort of guarantee or warranty, etc. Um, so then you have to fork out for that. So it's nice to put some aside in a, in a pot. Obviously, if you don't use that pot, um, once the tenancy is over or, or etc., you don't have to leave it there. You can always draw draw some out, etc. But we always uh, do recommend a 10% contingency, contingency pot set aside is definitely going to help for any unwarranted surprises that may arise. Certainly, certainly, um, which they always do, or at some stage they, they will. Okay, cool. So, yeah, let's just quickly recap then. So prior to um, the actual letting of the property, we've got the sourcing administration fees, legal fees, mortgage fees, and when a project completes, stamp duty, um, and then you want to think about furnishing your property. Once we're up and running, you want to think about your management fees, service charges, and ground rent. And then also things like maintenance costs, um, either ad hoc or, or continuous ones set, set aside in a, a contingency pot, um, and then also insurance as well. So, and yes, I think the only thing I would add is that obviously this sounds like a lot, um, and we've tried to cover most of the areas that, that you would expect to see costs come from. Um, but yes, if you're speaking to anyone that's ad advising or assisting in your investment search, uh, they should be able to give you a very specific idea of what each of those costs are going to be when they're going to be incurred. So you can really, really work out what your return on investment and your net yields are going to be after these costs have been taken into account. So yes, that's the main costs that you need to think about uh, when purchasing property. And next week, tying in with the subject we spoke about today. So obviously today we've gone over costs to purchase and ongoing costs. We're going to cover the actual purchase process and obviously this is going to be more focused towards a new build or off plan property but it is uh, another question that investors do tend to ask if they're not familiar with the process. So next week we'll be covering the purchase process. Yeah, that should be a good one. So as as Toby mentioned, we'll go through the purchase and reservation process, the conveyancing process, and then the construction update and site visits leading up to project completion. And then what you can expect on project completion right up until your units let and then you're receiving funds in your account. Good, good. Well, we will see you all next week. Thank you for tuning in this week. And if you have any questions as usual, please feel free to reach out to the team here at Track Capital. Uh, see you next time. Thanks, guys. See you soon.